Welcome to Moonbeaming, a podcast about magic, creativity, the tarot, lunar living, and more. I'm your host, Sarah Faith Godestiner, and I'm so happy you're here. Hello, 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 hello. Welcome back to another episode of Moonbeaming. Ming. That little song is how I greet my dogs most mornings and sometimes my partner. And now I'm greeting you. I hope this finds you feeling as beautiful and as brilliant as you are. And if not, that's okay too. We talked about in the last episode this idea of aftercare. And so maybe you just need to settle into some aftercare practices after uh, the month that June has been. It's been a trip. It's been a lot. And you're probably feeling it. So you're not alone. That's for sure. Just a couple of housekeeping notes before we begin. First and foremost, all caps, thank you, thank you to all the patrons supporting the show. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We cannot do it without you. I'm so grateful for you. I can't even express. If you'd like to support the show, you can do so at patreon.com backslash the moon studio. Depending on the level of support, you get a tarot spread a month. That's totally original. You get an additional episode where you can ask me anything and I answer you. Our monthly guide, you also get first access to my books when they open and discounts on live classes. And that's all to show my appreciation of your generosity. So you can head on over there if you're curious. Next little bit, next little bit of housekeeping is if you haven't left a five-star review yet and you love the show, because of course you love the show, you're listening. Hi, hello. You're not hate listening. Would you hate listen? Does anyone hate listen to podcasts? I don't think that's a thing. So you want to leave a five-star review. And if you do, you'll be entered to receive a 30-minute tarot reading with me. We pick from all the reviews. So if you reviewed it last year, if you reviewed it last week, you are entered. It is um, totally, what's the word? Arbitrary. Uh, Who gets chosen? Um, But we will choose a winner of the reading in the first week of July. So stay tuned for that announcement. And to everyone who's written a review, thank you. Again, I'm just filled with so much gratitude. It's so wonderful to hear your reviews. And also, this is how other people can find the podcast. I am totally indie. There is no one backing me. Um, There is no corporation. This is just me doing this. And so, you know, it's how I want to do it, to be honest with you. It's not that I wouldn't not link up with a company or something. But honestly, I just like doing things in my own way. Maybe you're the same. I don't know. But anyway, reviews and shares really help other people find the show. So I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Okay. Last little bit of housekeeping. This weekend, this Sunday, I'm holding a cleaning and clearing um, meditation. I guess it's actually clearing and cleansing, but you know, um, lots of C's. If you're not on the newsletter list, I suggest you sign up to get the details. And if you're hearing this past the date, when you sign up for the newsletter, that's how you won't miss what's going on. And this meditation is based off of the cord cutting ritual in this month's guide. I did it. I did it in May. It worked really powerfully, so powerfully. I'm doing it again myself after I guide others through it. You know, after I did it, this is a pro tip for all you witches, I know it worked because literally once a day for three days in a row after I did this cord cutting ritual, a person who was not really cool to me, not super cute in their behavior came to me out of the woodwork one after another. One was from someone who I hadn't spoken to in a decade. That's how you know a cord cutting worked, by the way. That is a successful 
energy release. So if you feel like you are needing that, either sign up for the meditation or download the studio's June guide and you'll get that. Okay. All right. So this show, this episode, it is, I say this every time, but that's because I talk to really, really interesting, brilliant, creative people. And you know that, right? This is a very special show with a very special guest. I got to speak with the one and only Alice Sparkly Cat, who wrote the book Post-Colonial Astrology. It is a must read. Everyone needs to buy this book, whether they're an astrologer or not. Even if you're not into astro, you need to get this book. It is an instant classic. Get it. Get the book. Have your mind blown. Personally, I am super grateful to Ace for writing post-colonial astrology because it really lays out so clearly a lot of the issues I've had with Western astrology, namely the correlation to the Roman Empire and colonization. Not really here for either of those things, and I'm sure you're not either, gentle listener. So, you know, sometimes we can confuse spirituality for the people interpreting it and calling it spirituality. You know, the people using spirituality or religion can sometimes be used as a placeholder for beliefs. You know, Uh, maybe the people using it, their beliefs aren't really the best or aren't really ethical, you know. And so if spirituality is created by people's experiences and beliefs, maybe let's pick people who didn't think it was okay to enslave other people and pillage land and enact genocide and colonization. Maybe let's not use that lens in our spiritual pursuits. You know, like there's other choices. We've got lots of other choices. So that's been one of my issues, or I should say barriers to entry with doing a deeper dive for myself in Western astrology. I'm fascinated by it. I love it. I think it's expansive. I think we're actually not using it all to its benefit. I think it's like even more phenomenal and and bigger and greater than we can even conceive of, to be honest. And also I've had to enter into more of an intimate way, like through my own experiences with astrology, which has been great because it's felt like a space where I can encounter these energies and these archetypes on my own terms. But it's also been a place where I've encountered a lot of uneasiness with a practice that I haven't necessarily with other modalities, you know? And also to be clear, that's like so many modalities. We all get to take what we'd like and leave the rest, you know? That's definitely tarot. And also what I love about tarot is it is relatively new and we know a bit more of the history around it. So then we can F with it a little bit more. We can transform it and evolve it a little bit more. There's a little bit more of um, a lack of preciousness. Uh, I'll just put it that way with tarot. And that's actually why I love tarot. I love it because it mutates. I love it because it changes. I love it because it can grow. And actually, I think you know, all modalities need to be constantly reimagined, revisioned, so on and so forth, you know? So again, like we need to grapple with challenging parts, with harder parts. We also can transform modalities to reflect more inclusivity. And as Alice Sparkly Cat points out in this interview, just straight up more truth, you know, um, they talk about that in this interview. So it's a great one. We go over a lot of the book. A shares what their process writing it was like, what they learned through researching. They talk about their practice, their astrology practice. We talk about Mars and Venus and Saturn and what cosmic body has been helping Ace with their healing. You will love this conversation, I promise. So if you've ever felt unsure about your practices you've ever had a lot of questions around spirituality, you wanted to feel like you could ask, or you wanted to feel okay with having questions or being skeptical, this conversation is for you. If you've ever felt like an outsider around a modality, philosophy, belief system, spiritual community, or spirituality that everyone else seems to just get or accept and love, then this episode is for you. And here is a content warning. The West is violent. 
So we touch upon some of those violent aspects in this conversation. So don't listen if you don't want to. Take care of you, okay? There's a lot more episodes you can listen to. Uh, So you take care of you. So I present to you the wonderful Alice Sparkly Cat. Hello, hello. I am here with a very, very special guest. Uh, I'm sure that many of you listeners know who my guest is. It is Alice Sparkly Cat, otherwise known as Ace. Would you please introduce yourself uh, to our listeners? Yeah. Thanks for talking with me, Sarah. Thanks for hanging out for a little bit. Uh, My name is Alice Sparkly Cat or Ace. You can call me Ace too. And then I am an astrologer. So I practice by uh, just, I mean, working with clients mostly. I I do some writing too. Uh, I do some writing on my website. I wrote this book called Postcolonial Astrology. And maybe we can talk a little bit about it today. I think that's all we're going to be mostly talking about. (laughs) I'll be quoting from the book by the time this interview is over, all of our listeners will have already clicked on that link that we'll also have in the show notes. So yes, I also, one thing I wanted to ask you before we get more into the book is, are you an artist? Like, did you used to make art? I did actually. Yeah, I used to make art. I don't really make art anymore. Uh, I mean, you know, not like drawings or paintings or anything. Yeah. But you used to make like visual art? I used to, yeah, I used to make some visual art, like nothing cohesive or anything, but yeah, I used to do that just, yeah. What do you think some similarities between art and astrology are? So many, yeah. I think that you're making meaning often in collaboration with other people. And then I think some there's some like really essential differences too, because I think like when you're an artist, you're like, hey, like, you know, let me create my own language. Uh, And then you're like, sometimes you're talking less with people. And I know there's artists who practice like social practice, things like that. Um, But there is this idea of like, hey, like, you know, you're the artist, you're creating your own world. Um, With astrology, I think it is more collaborative because you are having to talk with people, like you're having to be more legible. And then uh, it's a, it's, a lot less institutions in astrology as well um and then you're also you're also making meaning um the expectation isn't so much like that you're creating your own language but that's what people do with it too so then yeah there's so many similarities there's some differences yeah there are i mean the as you were talking the other thing i thought of i used to be a visual artist and now the majority of my time is spent writing and also seeing clients and I think that I'm not saying that like hashtag not all art but I think that there's this real element of service uh that exists in like practicing counsel counseling like things uh being in conversation with people that I know it exists in art in a different way but it's really at the forefront whenever you're trying to aid hate uh aid or help other people that I think is like really different fundamentally you know yeah I like the way you put that like the the service aspect yeah so you're like super like I feel you feel glad that you are mostly practicing astrology these days yeah I'm an astrologer I'm not an artist anymore. <laughs> what is what is astrology astrology is a language uh, so it's yeah there's many types of astrology it's just like there's many types of different languages and astrology is a language that just tries to orient your place in the world yes I also wanted to talk a little bit about actually now I'm thinking again about art and astrology where I feel like art can be more art making can be more of a free-for-all and astrology has a specific lineage, there are specific symbols, there are specific meanings, there are, you know, there's, you talk about this a lot in the book as astrology, uh, like a gaining power by histories, uh, different histories as well. And I'm just kind of wondering where you sort of, you start to do this in the book, or you do do this in the book, and we're going to talk about it more. But I think about well, what happens when we have this sort of structure that we're trying to create ourselves in or see ourselves within, 
that wasn't necessarily created for us. Everything that you see in astrology, every archetype, every symbol, like every way of making meaning, it's created through as much conflict as there is agreement. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of stuff is shaped by people who have a lot of political power. But then a lot of stuff is shaped by people who don't have a lot of political power, too. And then so when you're looking at the archetypes, like you'll see a lot of dualisms, you'll see a lot of contradictions. And that's why. Yeah, that's what makes it like so complex and cool, too. And makes it a living thing that we can change or that we can invest in through our own lens. Yeah. 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 So in the book, you write astrology is time magic because it frames and reframes temporality. Can you talk a little bit more about this idea of of astrology being time magic? Yeah, that's why I wanted to kind of explore with uh, with the book is like is what's Western astrology. And it's not like it's not like a historical overview or anything. It's not linear. Like we're kind of looking at like how the West is something that's created in post um, is created by the act of remembering. Like, I mean, so like with astrology, like you're looking at time, you're looking at the mechanics of time also. And then so like what you're doing is you're um, you're trying to talk about how like just the moments that make change possible. Whoa. Wait, can I interrupt you for a minute? Yeah. What would you, what is a moment that makes change possible? I think that a lot of times asking a question, I mean, just like, and like, just when you're like looking at a chart with a client too, you're like, Hey, this transit's happening. Like what kind of change do you think is possible? Like, what do you want to get out of this transit? Or what did you experience when this happened? I feel like that's just when you're kind of always looking at things like with the expectation of change. Like even when you're looking at like two charts overlap, you're looking at two different times and you're overlapping them together. Um, you're looking at the chart in motion all the time. So you're, yeah, you're looking at time basically. Do you think that how astrology is time magic is that it is the um, possibilities of change realized? I think so. I think it's when we think that change is possible, that there's different types of futures possible. I think that it's when we remember the past. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so this the book is heavily, heavily researched. Like it's filled with context and citations did you know who you were going to pull in before writing it like did the research you were doing end up guiding the content I'm really curious about your process and putting this together because it's such a hefty like the question you're asking the questions you're asking are so huge so I'm, I feel like it must have been a huge undertaking. So I'm just really curious about your process and, and how you kind of went about uh, formulating all of this and compiling all of this. Yeah, I feel like like the making the book, it was a reading project for sure. Because I read, <laughs> I found it, I think. I read like 100 books to make this book. And I knew that I would pull in some people like Sarah Ahmed because she talks about orientation. That's just like, it's so much about astrology. Yeah. Um, about astrology. Um, I, yeah. I, I mean, I was taking a class on Marxism at the time. I'm going to go back to the class. I just emailed the teacher. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, you're all sorry. I had to write a book. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was just like, yeah, I, I couldn't make it for last month or something, but I'll come back. And then, um, so I was learning a lot about capital through him. Uh, yeah. He just does this free class. Where he makes it really accessible. And then, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's some other people, Sylvia Winter, I knew that I would talk about her essay. And, and um, but then like some of it was I would go on like JSTOR, I had a free login from someone and then I would just search Sun or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and just like kind of I would um, like look through things, uh, like kind of underlying things and then pull the quotes out and then organize them by topic and just mm-hmm. kind of see what comes up to. Mm. Was there anything in doing all of this, like, was there anything that really surprised you or that delighted you? Yeah, there was some really shocking things around, like, Venus and Mars. I thought I would gender more, but then I was like, oh, my God, gender's all about war. I had no idea. Uh, And then 
uh, Mercury and Jupiter too, where like I thought I would be talking about technology. I originally wanted to be called like capital power and technology. And then mm. uh, I was like, oh my God, technology is just this construct that doesn't exist. Like it's all about <laughs> the And yeah, I was really shocked. I think with a lot of the stuff around capital too, I was like, you know, we're like, oh, put money in the bank. It's going to like accumulate an interest or something. I'm like, oh my God, this is like actually about exploiting reproductive power. Um, mm hmm yeah, we're going to go through some of We're definitely, I definitely want to talk about Venus and Mars. Uh, I definitely want to talk about the moon. I love the, uh, the entomology of Mercury as well. So we'll talk about that for sure. Um, it's cool though, that you were so like open when you were finding stuff, you're like, oh my gosh, like it's so, it sounds like this project shaped you as well as when you were writing it. Yeah. That's cool. The other thing I, I wanted to say, like, it's also really, it's really intense. Like it's a really intense, challenging book. Right. Um, and it's also full of like so many weird things. Like I, the thing that stuck out at me, I just finished the book this morning, but, uh, so I, I know I'm definitely still processing and I know that I'll have to read it, uh, multiple times because it's so filled with, uh, it's just so emotionally rich and dense, but like that weird thing about Valens and Mars and rape, like those sorts of things. Okay. So that was part of the errata. Like I checked with Chris Brennan, who's writing, a like a biography or yeah, biography of Valens. And it turns out I misquoted him. Like, you know how I'm like sourcing, uh, te like text, uh, and then underlining, I'm typing it out again. I was like, oh, like, you know, Valens did this thing. It turned out like Valens was referencing someone else who committed oh. the act of violence. So the association is still there between Mars and Ruination. Like, you know, it makes no difference with that, but it wasn't Valens himself. Okay, got it. Well, it's funny that I, you know this, you're an astrologer. We're recording this during Mercury retrograde. And I feel like this is like <laughs> a Mercury retrograde moment. You know, you're like, actually... Yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned it because I was like, you know, I have to make this clear somehow. Uh, like, it's going to uh, show up in the reprint. Like, it will be fixed in the reprint. But I was like, oh, my God, everyone who got the first print is going to have that error. These things happen. We're human beings. I wanted to ask, like, how did you take care of yourself when you were writing and researching this? Yeah, I was really busy during it because I was also working. Like, yeah. And then so it was a lot of work for sure but I mean like normally like you know I cook for myself I, <laughs> I like I just mean like it didn't emotionally take a toll on you it did yeah I remember once I just went to my roommate's room it's like I just like spent all day like reading thinking about sexual assault it was just so heavy actually yeah yeah um there can be an like invisibling of politic in like the spiritual world, in spiritual spaces. And obviously they are very political as you talk about in your book, uh, as much as anything else. Like I believe everything is political. Um, why do you think there is this tendency to squish the politics out of the occult, astrology, magic, the spiritual realms? I think it's because of privilege. Yeah. I mean, it happens everywhere too, not just with spirituality or astrology. It happens with art, happens with um, like literature, you know, all these things are political. But then like sometimes when it's only being practiced by people with a lot of power and privilege, like for themselves, then like, I mean, they, yeah, they, they can choose not to see certain things. I'm just wondering, like my thought was like, do you think it's because people feel like it would be less magical or reverent if they thought about the context. Like, what do you, like, I just, I'm trying to like, think about in particular, there's this, you know, there's so much about like spiritual bypassing um, in spiritual spaces and obviously cultural appropriation and all of, and there's also this thing around niceness and being positive and like criticality and questioning and contextualization not being positive or spiritual and like that's sort of what I was thinking about yeah that's actually I mean I think yeah that's sometimes like how the industry is shaped sometimes I got fired for a, from a horoscope writing gig for like not having positive enough horoscopes actually oh, no. 
And this was like this, this was last June too. Oh my God. Oh no. It was in June, 2020. Yeah. Yeah. June, 2020. I was like, you're like of all of the times right, right, right. <laughs> in all of history for my horoscope to not be super shiny. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, I don't, I think you're right. There is this expectation sometimes it's like, Oh, you know, we have to transcend these mundane problems or something, but right. I mean, yeah, no, no, no. Like spiritual, it has to speak to your lived experience. Yeah, you know, your book, because your book is uh, like, it really got me thinking about humans and like this odd tendency as well to distance the human aspect from astrology, the occult, magic, spirituality. Like the fact is, is that humans made this up, right? Um, and I, like, the thing is, I... I I personally believe we can get into your beliefs in a minute. I actually believe that astrology, spirituality, magic, they exist. Like they exist in the world. Whether their humans were here or not, they would be there. That's just my personal belief. But you know, humans translate it in their own language through their own lens. And it also got me thinking about because you have this weaving throughout the book of responsibility. And I sort of think of like, huh, is the lack of like, is, is saying like, oh, God told me to do this or, oh, Jupiter did this to me or, you know, whatever the elements, the, the spell I did, whatever it is. Do you think it's like also ties into uh, wanting to be absolved of, of personal accountability and responsibility? Like, what do you think about that? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Like this feeling of like, you know, spiritual love, it will like absolve you of your sins um and like yeah and that's really like kind of a christian idea too um but it's like oh no like love and practice like it's actually like so much about responsibility it's like it's so hard actually yeah it's really hard I, it's also this now that i'm thinking about it more i feel like if we say oh god did this or Mer mercury did this or whatever it takes it in a way kind of makes it less magical or less intimate because it takes away the relationship and it, you know like it's like oh no i have this relationship with mercury or uh, oh i have this relationship with spirit or whatever it is so I th it's like it kind of ends up mimicking like uh, authority type of relationships you know yeah like you you only reference the mediator it's like oh no like actually astrology languages it's here so that you like create a relationship to each other yes Yes, exactly. And so like, do you think it is just privilege? Like my, I had a question that was like, why do you think a lot of people are afraid to change and question astrology, magic, spirituality, healing practices? Is it simply privilege, you think? Too much work? Yeah, I think it's privilege because like personally speaking, I'm like, it's very easy for me to like know the things, like know how I'm impressed. It's so like much harder for me to like know the ways that I'm oppressing other people like those are things that I can just gloss over and not have to look at yeah um so you think that that yeah it's tied up in there that definitely makes sense one thing that you talk about in the last chapter is healing being about acknowledging racial violence sexual violence technological violence the violence of colonialism you know, that astrology or, of course, you know, spirituality, magic, whatever it may be, need to talk about these things so that it can be a healing tool. Uh, you write, for astrology to be healing, it must address capital, power, and labor. Heal yourself despite of and in resistance to the West. The healing comes from your survival and not from astrology. What do you think like, how do you think folks can sort of go about beginning to do this um, in, in, in astrology, other, th other than buying and reading your book, of course? Well, I think just by, yeah, like, looking at your decisions, I mean, you can use astrology to talk about these things, you can use, um, you know, another language, um, but like, yeah, just kind of, like, like you have to reckon with pain when you're healing too. And um, I mean, Western astrology, like it's a, it's a great language for that because a lot of the archetypes, like they arise from pain. 
Um, but yeah, just, I mean, yeah, giving yourself time. It, I think it's so different for everyone. Yeah. I feel like I'm being really vague right now. Cause <laughs> yeah. I'll be more specific. What, what's a planet or like a astrological archetype that has helped you heal? Oh, thanks for that question. Maybe the moon. How so? Yeah. I mean, I'm just thinking about like, you know, what play looks like for me right now. Uh, and I was talking to Mecca Woods and Janelle Belgrave on Stars on Fire about this is what play looks like for me right now is like role playing. And I think that like when I role play a lot of the characters that me and my partner kind of pick, like they're like they're a little bit bestial. They're a little bit like they're like a little bit cat like um, they're often pregnant. Like it's about kind of like caricaturing the moon and it's fun yeah it's really sexy and it's really fun but like i think yeah just so much of that i don't yeah it has to do with how i'm healing my relationship to like having a body um mm, yeah and and care mhm yeah. and also being able to change right mhm yeah i love that that's beautiful uh i'm going to do another alice sparkly cat quotable western astrology is not a universal truth it is not something from which you will gain an understanding of your authentic self. And that line made me think of this monolithic quality. We'll see people talk about, you know, that there's this one way, one universal truth, one source. And in fact, we know there are like a million, right? And so I was wondering, how do you think that spiritual tools or astrological language can responsibly address all human experience? Mm, I think by just, yeah, having different forms you know, of practice, having different languages, um, because there are no universals. Like saying that Western astrology, that's not universal, is really obvious because there's no such thing as a universal language. Too. Yeah, for sure. Um, so just like, being able to resist what we don't like or being able to get intimate with what we do like. Yeah. I think that by choosing, choosing your languages and then like seeing them change as you practice, uh, knowing that what kind of speaks to you will be really different for someone else. Um, yeah. Just creating a lot of room with translation, with playing with possibilities. Like I'm sure my spiritual practice is really different than my cat. But then she has her own spiritual practice, too, I'm sure. And being okay with, like, being accepting of your cat's beliefs and spiritual practice. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, though it's hard, to because I think her spirituality has a lot to do with nagging me to play. <laughs> so we go back to the relationship, of course. Yeah. I wanted to ask you this question, because this is something, actually, I personally have been grappling with, and I haven't... I don't have an answer. And when I talk about it with people, they don't have an answer. And I think it's okay. I, want, I also want to say, like, I think it's great to not have an answer. I think it's awesome to be unreconciled. I think that needing to have an answer to everything is stressful and toxic. And it's not always like the way to go. So I just want to put that out there first. But, you know, I have this issue. <laughs> I'm going to bring up this uh, very famous writer and teacher Carl Jung. I have this issue with Carl Jung, as many people do, and many people are really inspired by C Carl Jung. And I'm saying Carl Jung because Carl Jung is probably like the most famous problematic person, although probably there are many more. I mean, I'm sure there are. And he's one of the most famous astrologers. Yeah, yeah, maybe that's why I thought of him, but it's just something I've been very influenced by him as like, a white lady in spirituality, as many white ladies in spirituality are. And then, of course, you learn about uh, his, I mean, all of the problems. I, I would be here all day if I went down the laundry list of how he was as a person and what he did and also what his beliefs were, right? So, like, by Carl Jung saying that there's a monolith, uh, by Carl Jung saying that there's the collective, right, that is sort of feeding into Aryan ideals, right, of... Uh, race stuff and you get in I mean you talk about race so much in your book um, and maybe that's also why I'm thinking of him as well here but you know it's like what do we do when 
people we are inspired by, you know, some of some of his ideas, of course, which were probably also stolen, right? Um, he's very good at branding. Carl Jung is very good at branding. Um, and that's probably one of the reasons why he was successful. And I think he was pretty brilliant and talented as well. What do we do when like, we're like, wait, I think maybe this person's ideas are racist. But and also some of the things that they say, I'm inspired by and it's really helped me, you know, like, have, do you, have I'm sure you must have thought about that in writing this book or, or something like that. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Well, for me, it's not Jung. Like, I don't really know too much about Jung. Uh, yeah, I mean, he, like, a lot of his work just doesn't speak to me. So I haven't really explored it too much. Uh, for me, it's Dane Brundar. And then, because, um, like, I got into his stuff, the solely lunar cycle, things like that. I'm like, oh, my God. Like, a lot of this is just appropriated from ideas about yin and yang. Uh, and then... Like, what kind of happens with them? Like, okay, like, he's talking about, like, gender a lot with yin and yang. And that's what starts all this new age shit about yin and yang being related to masculine and feminine. Uh, but, like, yin and yang, it's not, like, it's not really about gender. There's a gendered component. But it's not, yeah, it's, not, it's like, it's totally different than what he's talking about. And then, like, I'm reading his stuff as an Asian person. I'm like, okay, like, you know, there's, like, something about, like, engaging with that work that just feels really uh, extractive and violent, too. Um, and then, like, so much about how I learn about what it means to be Asian has to do with how the West imagines Asia. Um, and yeah, even the concept of Asia itself, it's not a real place. Like it encapsulates everything from the Pacific Islands to the Middle East. Like it's about the West imagination. So I'm like, yeah, you know, like we are these mythical beings and we are created by imagination in some ways. And why not just use these archetypes and then run with it and make them into your own thing and not pay homage to Dane Rudar or Carl Jung or whatever it is and just... Yeah, just practice your relationships. Mm, yeah. My thing is that I've just been like, well, I, I feel the need to bring them up because I'm citing from them or like I got the seed of an idea. And then, I, but then I bring it up and I'm like, and also we all know that he was problematic, but maybe I just have to start not even mentioning, you know, but that's something for me to think about more on my own. All right. Thank you for that. I also quote, I also learned a lot. So I wrote a book about the moon and one of my sources is Dane Rudyard, like his lunar archetypes, you know, were very influential for me. Um, so, and, and I know that a lot of what he did was steel, you know? And yeah, so. Like, it's not, just, like, it's not just the stealing, but like the misinterpretation aspect too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Um, not like translating another culture's ideals devoid of their culture, devoid of their context, devoid of their religion or belief systems, um, and then spinning it into whatever uh, works for them or or what they think that is. Right. Like he and Alan Leo both like kind of create these Asian images or identities um, but then their work, like, their work is about their own ideas. Like, it's Dane Rudar's ideas around gender. It's Alan Leo's ideas around science. And then they're saying that they got all this stuff from India or China or whatever it is. Um, but if you look at their work, they never mention a single Indian or Chinese astrologer. So it's like, it's none of, it's the, yeah, they have nothing from Asia. It's, they're creating, like, the identity of the Asian. Yes, yes. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, another quote from you is good astrologers are storytellers. Good astrology acknowledges and resists capital, power, and labor. Good astrology shrinks the West. There's no one way to practice good astrology. I gotta say, I have so many, <laughs> I copied and pasted like so many of your quotes that I could just spend this whole time reading them to you. So maybe I'll try not to as much, but um storytelling is this organizing mechanism and you tell so many stories in this book i wanted to talk about venus and anana if we could talk a little bit about that because i didn't actually know that story uh the the story of of the uh rape with inana and as you told that story 
it really crystallized and put together how Venus is linked to both Taurus and Libra uh, in a different way. So do you mind sharing a little bit about Venus, Inanna, war, violence, um, you know, this, what, what Venus uh, represents? Yeah, I didn't know about that story either, because I feel like we hear that story about Inanna going into the underworld a lot, uh, at least at, you know, the places I've been to um, in terms of astrology conferences and the like. And um, yeah, and then that story is about Inanna. She goes to the underworld and at every gate she has to take off an article of clothing and she's visiting her sister. And like at the fine at the core of how like she uh, is completely nude and then her sister hangs her upside down. She can't get out. She has to choose a substitute. And then she gives three mercies to her son, her handmaiden and her servant. And then she chooses her husband to replace her as sacrifice. And then um, in the other story, which is about Inanna being assaulted, she wakes up and she realizes like she's been taken, um, she's been insulted. And then um, and like uh, she looks for the guy who assaulted her and she looks in three places and then she kind of brings like three plagues into the world. Um, and I think she finds him and kills him or something like that. I can't remember the ending. But yeah, I mean, Venus, um, Venus... Uh, was a war goddess and Venus is about justice a lot of the time. And so as a war goddess, like she kind of stands for civil society and like, uh, yeah, that's why like she, a lot of times like she's contrasted with Mars and things like that. So I think like what you lay out in the book is that Venus is this symbol of, I, I love how you spoke about like Venus's love and material things and peace because of war. Like it it's has to be sort of linked to war, right? Yeah, yeah, it has to be linked to war, yeah. And that really blew my mind just because I had, I mean, it's funny in my own mind, like with my own relationship to Venus, I actually have a, like a relationship to Venus that is, or my, I have an interpretation of Venus that is more fierce, I guess you could say. Um, but I had never, I didn't know that. I didn't know about the link of like, was it that Julius Caesar that was like, love Venus? Was that right? Yeah, he always wore her symbol, like, or its symbol on his ring. Yeah, so I keep saying her because we were talking about Inanna, but I, like, I, I try to call the planets it whenever possible. Yes, I apologize if I'm also called, I do think of Venus as a her, but yes, planets are not neutral or they're gender neutral, of course, they, or they have many gender, genders or no genders. That's what I always say. Um, yes. So yeah, I thought that was really fascinating. That part about Venus as being like always associated with the inside, the, the land or the city that needed to be protected and yeah. Mars being associated with, like, what did you say? Like, a loser or something? Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, Mars was seen as a loser. Like, he was Zeus's least favorite son. That's Aries. And, like, he would always be uh, depicted as being on the losing side of things. Because, like, he represents loss. Uh, and then, so Mars was actually seen to be, like, a foreign god also. And so that's why he's, like, always kind of like seen in the ranks of foreign armies and that was like okay like you know these guys are gonna lose this kind of thing um so yeah venus uh venus is about what we're protecting and then what you know what is seen to be worthy of protection um and then mars is what we're protecting venus from yeah that's that really fascinating how you tease that out um, also like the specific kind of masculinity and the specific kind of femininity that you point out where similar to what you just talked about with like, say, Dane Rudyard painting a picture of what they think the East is, or they think that other cultures are, Venus is this idea of what the West thinks of femininity and what the West thinks of masculinity, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Both of them are, yeah, yeah. But they're not real. Like, it's just this image. It's just the dream within the dream that you kind of talk about. Right, right, right. I also really loved the chapter on Saturn. Um, what was your favorite chapter to write? To write? Maybe to write was probably Mercury and Jupiter because I feel like that one, like, 
I mean, that one, like, because it's about, like, kind of the climate, like, climate change, and um, it's about, like, hey, how are we going to survive? How are we going to keep storytelling? Like, it felt a little bit lighter to write than, you know, capital exploitation, like, sexual assault. So, yeah, that one was, like, the, maybe, like, the lightest one to write, yeah. Yeah, I liked how you, I liked how you spoke about Mercury as never getting in trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he he doesn't get in trouble, right? Lucky, lucky him. And I loved how you talked about, like, uh, Mercury taking the turtle and turning it into the instrument and that it's, what did you say? It's like, it wasn't that Mercury killed it. It was that it turned the turtle into, like, a non-living thing. Yeah, he turned something living into something animated. Thank you. Yes. And then there was like then that tie between Mercury and the underworld and the subterranean. And I thought that was really fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So there is a darkness to Mercury because it has a relationship to death. Um, And so that's labor. It's about turning something living into something that's animated. And then, yeah, we see that like show up in different ways, too. I feel like that's also where like this, this, um, not the ghost part of Mercury, but like that spirit part of Mercury where like, I think that like something that's not explored a lot about Mercury is that one, like they're queer to that. They can um, to that. They're a psychopomp and that they do spend some of their time in the world of, of the dead. And so then I think that there's also this, like this spirit contact aspect of Mercury uh, I want to say goth a little bit of uh, Mercury that isn't like always sort of talked about. And so I'm, I'm glad that you went into that just a little bit there. Yeah. 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 Cause it's like, Oh, well, like hermetic that's Hermes, like um, cryptics, like crypt. Yeah. With Mercury, like, cause it retrogrades so much. It's always going into the underworld and back. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about the Saturn chapter two. I love how you had this, connection between uh, Saturn, the land, ancestors, and sustainability and revolution. And I was hoping that you could share a little bit about like your thought process around uh, thinking about Saturn, especially, especially with sustainability and revolution. With, yeah, with Saturn and land. I mean, yeah, I think Roxanne, uh, Dumber or to say it's like the history of the United States is a history of land. Um, and it's just, wow. Like the history of land is so brutal. Um, so when you, when you think about Saturn, like we have to think about that history too. Um, and we're like, I mean, we're seeing land being seized on the daily from indigenous people, like all the time, all across the world right now too. Absolutely. Um, and I, I for but I, I you had this tie in and I wish I had, it was the one quote I don't think I copied but it was like between you said like revolution is sustainable do you know do you remember when you spoke about that yeah yeah I think it has to be sustainable um, and it's it's difficult to figure out like what does sustainability mean like how is it sustainable? Um, I think around that time that I was writing that I was in a reading group where we were reading this essay. I can't remember who it was by the title of it was like the cops in our hearts and minds or something like that. And um, the writer, the writer said like for a revolution to be sustainable, like it has to be accessible for a single working mother. Um, And yeah, it's it's true because like you know a lot of like, yeah it's it's so hard to like kind of like you know take time off from work and to go somewhere or like you know to like even um, yeah even go out in the streets it's um, it's like a lot of um, yeah a lot of like how we imagine like nonprofit uh, movements to can be like a little bit unsustainable too um, so yeah it's hard yeah. So, like, how how do you reconcile practicing and loving something that you don't necessarily agree with in terms of, like, maybe an over-cultural definitions and things like that? You know, like, how do you, or, do, or do, does it not even matter? Or does this not even, like, come into consideration? 
I think that it just has something to do with how I've always practiced. Um, and because, uh, like, to give you a little bit of context, it's like, I mean, I've been writing fan fiction since I was a teenager. And so much of that is about using materials that aren't yours, um, that are sometimes provided by a corporation. Like, you don't agree with a lot of the source material. Um, and then you're making it into your own thing. Uh, so, like, I was writing for Yu-Gi-Oh, I mean, when I was a teen, mostly, but now I write fan fiction related to BTS. So I'm like, I'm, you know, BTS are like a neoliberal <laughs> phenomenon. It's a bunch of, like, you know, like, I don't want to call them sisters. I don't know if they're cis, but, like, it's, yeah, and I'm like, you know it's it's a group of uh it's a boy band and i'm a lesbian and then so it's kind of like you're just you're taking this thing you're you're making it yours through practice um because i am like okay there's not really like a lesbian boy band available not yet <laughs> yeah i think there is actually really? like i'm to bite my tongue it's called a crush and they've been created to market like a sports brand or something. i have never heard of that i mean there are so many like lesbian bands but you know a lesbian pop band would be pretty cool i feel like i also think wasn't there that like whatever i'm getting off topic i feel like there was that like i feel like there was some manufactured uh lesbian bands that were pop that weren't actually it turned out they just were like manufactured but yeah, I love I love that uh, I love the correlation between fanfic and astrology, and it makes it makes a lot of sense. And it because um, I have a lot of tension. Like I personally am like, what, is this the year I'm getting out? Like I'm like, am I gonna stop tarot reading? Am I gonna stop talking about this stuff? Um, I have personally a lot of tension, but it's more about the I guess like the spiritual industrial complex. I guess, suppose. Um, then sort of my own work or like what I'm doing when I'm alone or when I'm with clients or when I'm teaching groups and things like that. So um, I think that we need like more criticality, not less. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Cause yeah, you know, working with people like the practice of it, that's what like, yeah, keeps you feeling alive too. Absolutely. I have another quote from you. Uh, Use Western astrology to only acknowledge the influence of the West and to talk about capital, power, and labor. Don't use it for your own stuff. Make some room for your stuff. Make up your own stuff. Don't rely on Western astrology to heal you. Heal yourself in spite, of, despite of and in resistance to the West. Understand that when you heal, the healing comes from your survival and not from astrology. Western astrology is like race. It is an archetypal and magical imagination that classifies and limits any counseling session that does not acknowledge race, patriarchy, and capitalism will not be a counseling session that heals. How do you address these topics in your own sessions? And also, how do you suggest other practitioners address these subjects in their own sessions? Just kind of however it comes up for the client. Because we can, like, yeah, we might have like a whole session that's a about race but then the word race doesn't come up and instead we're talking about the clients like actual experience of things like um like you know their relationship to their family yeah co-workers friends and um so it's so different for everyone um but yeah i mean just by asking questions yeah yeah and holding like holding space right yeah and holding space how do you think like you've changed and grown in your practice from like a few years ago? Like, is there anything that you've really tried to change or, or, or do, you know, that you didn't in the beginning? Yes, yeah, so much. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that question. Cause like, I feel like we have this like idea of what astrologer is supposed to do. And that's my own shit. I'm like, those are the expectations. I'm like, worried that the client has of me, things like that. And that like, that gets in the way of the work. Um, and then so like, as I've become more, I mean, confident um, and just kind of like, yeah, just built more like clarity with my practice. I think that like being able to deal with some of those expectations on my own time and outside of the session has been really important. Um, so now it's like, oh, like someone can ask me, well, what does this mean? I can be like, I don't know. Like, let's find out what it means for you. And we can start to like 
hey, like, you know, what was happening to you, like, around this time? Um, how do you feel about this thing? Like, we can really kind of dig. I'm like, I'm not going to, yeah. Um, I think, like, when I was starting to practice, I felt a lot of pressure to delineate during the session. I'm like, hey, like, no, that's my own, that's my own shit. That's my own voice. Um, I don't have to delineate during the session. Like, the session is where we're like, really making new knowledge together. Um, and that takes, like, it. Like you can, you can say, I don't know. Oh yeah. For, yes. I love that. I love that you're, that you brought that up for sure. Because it, you might be an astrologer, but you're also like a human being. <laughs> like, you know, like the biggest thing for me, like that, I, that really helped me out was that, Hey, like speaking on my own, speaking on my own stuff, like, Hey, you can't, you can't like, heal someone in one 50 minute session or like you can't that, like that's not what this is about like you're 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 not like having all these expectations uh on ourselves when they're completely ridiculous and not serving um you know that was like a big thing for me for sure right yeah 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 and i think that's how like astrology it's so different from therapy too where therapists get to work with the same person like maybe sometimes every week for years and we just get like one conversation and so it's like no we're just yeah we're just asking some questions we're bringing out certain patterns we're connecting certain dots um but then like we don't really get to see like the whole thing yeah Exactly. Right. I love that. What do you wish that people coming to an astrology session would like know or think about or, or what, what would you like them to expect? I would like them to know what are some things they want to talk about. And the reason for that is because like, you know, when I go into a session, like when, um, when I book a reading for myself, I'm like, I know what, you know, what I want to talk about. Cause like, if you choose like one goal and you're focusing on that one goal or like one kind of like yeah, uncertainty or something like that, like, yeah, you can talk about so much more. And then, yeah, like, so coming in with a clear expectation and then communicating it to the astrologer or tarot reader. Um, and then like, so then we can spend time on what you want to talk about. Like that's, um, that's really important. Yes, I love that. What has been the best part of releasing your book? I think just like, I mean, seeing people, seeing that people are like reading it, which is a little bit like nerve wracking, but also like, I hope people are reading it. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's an awesome book. Uh, you, you have to pick it up. There'll be the link in the show notes. It is called Post Colonial Astrology Reading the Planets Through Capital, Power, and Labor. Ella Sparkly Cat, thank you so much for being here. Please let us know where folks can find you. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was good hanging out during the thunderstorm now. It just ended, yeah. Um, you can find me on my website, Alice Sparkly Cat. That's cat with a K dot com. Uh, you can find, I mean, I do some writing about astrology, some other things too. And you can, yeah, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram, yeah, Alice Sparkly Cat also, all one word. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for taking the time. All right, loves, that's the episode. Are you thinking? Are you feeling? Are you wondering? Are you running to get Isa's book like yesterday? Yes, you are. I hear you. I hear those beats. Clap, clap, clap. Tap, tap, tap. If you love this episode, please share it on social media. Follow Alice Sparkly Cat and leave us a review. Lots of love and until next time. Moonbeaming is brought to you by The Moon Studio. It is created and hosted by me, Sarah Faith Godestiner. It is edited by the incredible Caitlin George Parker. Additional support is by Stella Hartman. Music is by Will Owen and myself. If you like this podcast, you can support us by going to Patreon backslash The Moon Studio and becoming a patron. You can give this podcast five stars wherever you listen and also subscribe. 
We'd love it if you could let one or two or three or four or more friends know about us and we accept all good vibes. Thanks so much for supporting us. Witches on planet Earth, not flying up to Mars. There is no planet B. There's a witch wherever you